Welcome back to D and J's Epic Quest. I am Jay Rule, and joining alongside me here is Derek Cronus. I think I could have picked a different name from this book, but I know there was a D name, but I forgot it. So <laughs> I'll just be Derek Cronus or Derek, yeah. as usual. Makes sense. Well, I guess how you been? Good. Not nothing too much to report. Just kind of been a a normal week. So working and. Looking forward to some hockey this weekend. So, yeah, that's awesome, sir. Um, yeah, I would I would say I'm pretty much in the same boat. It's just been a a busy, but for the most part, chill week. Good, nice. Yeah. Well, well, I guess we should move on to our patrons, then, huh? Since we're so boring. damn boring. <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're not exciting. Yeah. All right. So, in order of subscription here, we've got Jan the Picker. Luciana Intriguing, Ryan the Topological, Damien the Rock of Faces, Nate Fiddle Me This, Shield Anvil Dylan, Calvin He Who Witnessed, Livia the Malazan Potato, Aaron Mott Irregular, Scott the Only, Graceless Passion, and Dead Smell. Did we get to do Dead Smell last time for the first episode or not? I don't remember. We did. I put it in there. Awesome. Yeah, I just couldn't remember. Our, uh, yes. We continue to grow our little chain of dogs, close to a pack now. We're probably more than a pack. Yeah. Yeah. It's really exciting to see this list. So it is. And it's fun. Uh, you know, we got the little chat going on on Patreon and it's fun talking with everybody and trying to bounce ideas off people, get feedback and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. What do you, what do you say? Should we wrap up this book? Should we the first and only time? Well, I guess the first time, I'm sure there will be another time where we have finished a book in two episodes. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if you saw, I posted on Twitter. I said, it's it's kind of weird to be finishing this book when we haven't even thrown out the first episode yet for it. It's not live yet. So that's kind yeah, of weird. It is a little strange, but yeah, let's uh, rock through a couple of these sections and see where we are for time. Sounds good. First section here. Subly bitched at Mansi about how the pigeons in and around their house and why he hadn't done anything about them. Her voice could find him anywhere in the house, and he only thought that soon he would be away from her. However, he knew he was being unfair towards her as his irritation stemmed from lack of sleep and his drinking the prior night. The kids cried upstairs, sent home from school due to catching the mange, which I don't think was H.C.'s mange, the magical drug village. Um, because their mother was horrified and Mansi knew an alchemist to treat them would be spendy. This was a disaster for their social standing. Again, Subly got on him about removing the birds. She had been in a good mood earlier, surprised he had found a job so fast, and when uh, he explained how he was paid, well, she had let him get an extra hour of sleep and had yet to beat him with a broom. They were able to afford an alchemist now and could even afford to move to a nicer part of town, closer to school. He thought to himself he should not be so mean to her. She stood by him all these years, and as anyone else has, she has her own history. The two children she had, born while he had been mostly at sea, and neither particularly looked like him, but he re raised them regardless of their blood. Subly rem reminded Mansi that she wanted the bird trap set before he left, and that he needed to stop by the expensive alchemist also. She wanted Hood's Herald to visit these damn birds. All Mansi could think was that soon, very soon, there would be distance between them. Um, one thing I'm just kind of catching here, I don't know if 
if this was just like a typo by me or if it was in this way in the book. Um, but Subley's name, is it two Bs or one B? Uh, or did we run into both of those in the book? No, it's one B. Maybe it was a grammatical, is it? Yeah. I know I typed it with two ones. I don't know if I, uh, you know, I feel like. Maybe yeah. it was like an autocorrect thing. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Hood knows. He might. Yes. So my question is, is like, do pigeons carry mange? I thought that was only like a cat or a dog thing. I don't really know what mange is supposed to be. It's like a uh, disease that's supposed to be. I mean, in HC's version, it's a little bit more fun than what I remember. Is it just like fleas or some shit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mange is a highly contagious skin disease caused by parasitic mites that affect mammals, birds, reptiles, and plants. Oh, well, so like it affects everything. Yeah. So my guess is that uh, Subly is thinking that these pigeons have given her children the mange. I mean, they, they probably did. I mean, I think I said it last episode, pigeons are just rats with wings, so. True. True. Um, the, I don't, I don't think I had a ton of thoughts throughout basically this whole book. Um, you know, it was just kind of a fun light read, but I liked, you know, this line where it says the kids getting sent home from school, you know, it's just a disaster for their social standing in town. And all I could think of was like, you guys are just like hanging on by the end of the rope here. <laughs> like, you don't have any further to go down. Yeah. How could this be a disaster? I think it's probably one of those like keeping up with the Joneses type thoughts that maybe Subly has. I mean, I wouldn't say gold digger is the word that I would give Subly, but I mean, she definitely does not seem to respect Mancy in any shape or the form, as we kind of learn a little bit about at the end of this little chapter slash section, whatever you want to call it. You know, I mean this neither particularly looked like him but he raised them regardless of their blood um kind of is insinuating that his kids are not his kids and right he's just stuck you know like i guess you know i've been in relationships like that where at a certain point you just kind of like what the fuck am i doing <laughs> life is like that sometimes sorry i don't have any great advice for a situation like that I know no, you're not there now. yeah sorry. no not at all but yeah, I'm not. I'm not really a, a huge fan of Subly, and uh, I totally get the reasons why he does what he does. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Um, that was my only thought here on this opening section of, I guess, what we'll call the second half of the book here. The only thing that stood out to me was the alchemist uh, was named Trout Younger, and I just kind of wonder if that was just a little Easter egg. Or if there is maybe some relation to talk and talk senior, yeah, but you know, maybe, maybe not. I don't know if that's just like a common thing, you know, it's obviously he's Trump, the younger, his dad must be Trump, the elder. Maybe that's just like a common thing, you know, instead of like junior or maybe you're right. Maybe there is a connection. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe in one of the books later on, talk slash Anister will say something about like a distant relative that's an alchemist or something if that's all it is i would jump for joy because i'll remember <laughs> <laughs> right but yeah no it was, it was yeah it was a nice i guess introduction to part two the last the beginning of the last half of the book right i, I think it, you picked a good spot to split it up so kudos but it's hey, a good, good spot i just yeah i just i would that purely just won it just went with it it worked. It worked good. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad. I think we probably could have knocked it all out in one episode, but it would have been, you know, a little longer. And yeah, this I is think fine. it's okay. Two to have. Yeah. All right. Well, section two here. Gold had given his report to the king. The king had shown fear, not only because of the nightly killings, but with what was going on in Stig and the rumblings from the core. Core. I can't say this word. Uh, the rumblings from. The Corley compact a little further to the south. Nonetheless, the king had babbled to Gold, a sergeant of the guard. Now Gold had heard more about Princess Sharn than he cared to know. He made his way down to Fishmonger's Round, with twilight settling on the town. He had done his duty, he had informed the king, and received the instructions to quell the rumors of any royal involvement. Lordson Holmes' father, who had a bit of clout, had been paid off. 
He left his corporal standing at the pole with the manservant ad, even though the death ward had made the posting less desirable to steal. News of the noble son's death had spread throughout the city, and shops were closing down and streets were emptying. As tonight, there would be hired killers out, indiscriminate in the noble's wrath. He thought to himself that he wouldn't want to be anyone on the street who didn't have a good cause to be there. He turned the corner and saw his corporal standing by himself at the pole, a crow perched on top, and some seagulls were fighting over something in the sewer trench. He walked up to the corporal and asked if he had any trouble. The man replied that he didn't, and he's been here all day. Gold apologized that it took him so long to get here, as the king had made him wait all day, and then asked the man if his feet were tired. The corporal replied that they were, and explained to Gold that he had heard from a rat hunter that there were two foreigners, and that they came in on the mist rider, their manservant as well. Gold wondered at this, and the corporal explained that the foreigners hired the coachman for Merchant Baltro. Gold said, all right then, and they proceeded to head towards Saruman's hostel. You know, again, just, you know, kind of a very straightforward little section. I didn't really have much to say, but uh, this part about the king had shown fear, and it kind of sounds like back in the day uh, when King Selger showed fear, he would send you to, like, an assassin to be killed, or potentially to the extent of hiring an assassin to dispose of you. I just thought that that was kind of brutal. And clearly, Selger it is really kind of, it seems like he's over his head a little bit. Like, he seems to be a little rattled, especially because, like, you know, it kind of seems like his, his daughter was pretty close to death. But also involved with somebody he's not really a fan of. Uh, particularly some of the things that they are doing with each other, which we find out a little bit later. I guess maybe I'm not understanding what you mean, or or maybe I'm not understanding how it's worded. So if King Selgir is showing fear, he's going to send assassins at who? Just whoever, whoever is causing him the fear. Or what if you don't know? I think it's just kind of meant to be one of those things where he's prior to Gold's interaction and, and the current state of affairs, he was probably a bit like indiscriminate as to who he took his wrath out on. You know, I guess I mean it would it would make sense to me that the king will send assassins out for sure, but I don't think like it wouldn't make sense to me that the king's like I'm going to send you to the assassins guild and they're just going to kill you there. Like, <laughs> like that's why you have like a headsman, right? Yeah, I mean, or whatever. But maybe but, I'm misunderstanding that part in the book. But that's kind of like my first thought was that gotcha. back in the day. If the king was afraid, he would irrationally do something about it. Just kind of lash out. Yeah. Gotcha. The other thought that I had was that there's this part where he says that he had, like, informed the king, I'm assuming, of, like, what he knows so far. But I thought in, like, uh, the previous episode, we had talked about Gold had told Stull, Orphan Stull, to inform the king. So I was a little confused. Like, are they relaying different pieces of information or i must have missed something or maybe he just didn't do it like he said he was going to maybe that's right but, yeah he did say he was going to yeah and then obviously you've confirmed this but the crow perched on top is is clearly corporal in his soul taken form i didn't catch this on my first read though i didn't either until you well there was a point where well yeah i mean it becomes clear later but because I was thinking, like, well, how the hell is he getting in and out of the room? You know, nobody's seeing him. He must just be flying out the window. Sorry, my cat's got all just stupid. Yeah. I mean, we knew that Corbo was soul taken because of Memories of Ice. Because Quick Ben blasts the bird on the mantle. Right. Yeah. yeah. I do remember, yes. Well, yeah. We, uh, like I said, it was a pretty short, pretty short section. Very transitional. You know, Gold is talking to the king making the information known to the king, kind of uh, quelling rumors of what had happened between his daughter and uh, Lordsome home, and making his way to continue an investigation, right? Yeah. Then let's proceed. All right. Dog the doorman grinned at Gold. That would have been my name, Dog. And he said he wasn't surprised that he was here at all. 
Gold stopped him from talking and said he was here to see a pair of foreign guests. Dog said they were odd. Neither hardly ever leave the room, and now that they have their manservant, they even eat in their room. Gold asked if they were both in the room, and Dog said he assumed so. Gold entered Saruman's and was met by the owner, Obler, who asked Gold if he was now doing honest work. Gold asked if Obler was doing honest work. Obler said it had been the case for years now. Gold wanted to talk to the foreigners. Obler went to fetch them, but Gold insisted on going with. At their door, Mansi answered. Obler said a guardsman was here to talk to his masters. Mansi's eyes went wide when he recognized the sergeant. Gold said it was strange he was here when he had just questioned him not two days ago. Mansi said there was nothing strange except for him or Gold showing up at his room. Gold knew he had a point and said he wished to speak to his masters. He may announce him now or whatever his masters wanted him to do. Mansi said his master wasn't taking guests. He was in the middle of, an, of important research. Gold tried to push past him and was surprised by his strength. That was when he re realized Mansi was an old soldier. He didn't like messing with veterans. Gold stepped back and put his hand on his sword and said Mansi had done more than should be expected, expected of him. But he, or Gold, was a sergeant of the city watch and this was an official visit. If he impedes further, he'll end up in the stocks. He asked Mansi not to make this messy. Mansi said if he let him in, he would probably be fired and he needs this job and he plans to keep it. However, he would do his best to answer any questions, but he couldn't promise much. Gold cursed and told Obler to get his corporal and told him to get up here double time with his weapon out. He told Mansi that he would make a lot of noise coming up. He would be disarmed and restrained in a loud fashion. In that situation, no master worth a damn should fire you. If he did it his way, he wouldn't be arrested or killed. If not, they would make it nasty and take their time. Mansi agreed and called him a bastard. When the corporal arrived, Mansi said to make it look good. There was a scrape and the door opened. Bauchlane quietly asked for his manservant to be released and invited the sergeant and Mansi into the room. Gold looked around the room and at the desk, there were ruins he didn't recognize. He asked Bausch Lane where he was from. He was told a distant land with a name that would be meaningless to him. Gold said he had an affinity for language, then asked how long it had been since he learned Theftian. Bausch Lane said he thought it was called Molian. Gold said theft is the island, Mol was the city. Bausch Lane said he learned it about three weeks back on his passage from Corral. He had hired a crewman to teach him. Gold said he was a sorcerer. He nodded and finally actually gave his name to Gold, who then asked about his traveling partner. Bosch Lane said his name was Corporal Broach and that he was a eunuch. Gold wanted to know where he was, perhaps in one of the trunks. Bosch Lane said he was outside the city. He didn't like crowds. Beyond that, he didn't know where. Gold wanted to know about the slate. Bosch Lane said they were imperfect efforts. The local slate had some interesting mineral properties. He is seeking to harness it towards order. Gold asked if they would remain in Mole Long. Bauchlane said it depended on if he was successful, though even his, his patience has its limits. Gold asked how he contacted his friend. Bauchlane said it was a simple matter of communicating and he would arrive at the rendezvous point. Gold asked if he was a necromancer. Bauchlane said he had no interest in delving into Hood's Warren. Gold said his manservant was a stubborn man, prepared to die to protect his privacy. Bauchlane said if he had known that, he would have had a cautionary provision, would have added a cautionary provision to his request. Gold said that would have been a good idea as he was close to losing a good man. Bauchlane asked if Gold wanted anything else. He said for the moment he was satisfied and asked if he had paid for the room in advance. Bauchlane said until the end of the week. As Gold stepped out of the room, he confirmed with Obler if he had paid ahead for the week. When told that was correct, he told his corporal to remain here until relieved and asked if there was a back door. He said there was, but it was triple bolted, so it was loud and would wake him up if opened. Gold asked if he had, if it had been used recently and was told not since before the foreigners had arrived. Gold said then, Corporal had to leave out the front door. Obler didn't know which one that was. Gold said the eunuch. Obler thought he was mistaken because he's only seen one out of the room since they had arrived. The other of them was in there. 
he had never left. Gold said he, or Obler, was the one who was mistaken and asked what the eunuch looked like. Obler said he was big and didn't say much, and he looked clammy as a dead whale. Didn't know he was a eunuch, but now that he mentioned it, it was simple enough to see. Awesome. I guess as far as your section here, um, I don't know. I, I really digged Mancy's like like false like heroism here. Like he didn't really need to stand up to gold. I mean, he thinks he did. Right. But then that's what I'm saying is like, I loved, I loved his like defiance. Yeah. I think, well, yeah, he doesn't want to lose the job. I think that's his main focus, but it also seems just kind of like probably the type of guy he is anyways. Yeah. You know, it's funny because like, you don't really get a lot of Mancy in memories of ice. And I mean, like you do, but you don't not like this. So it, right. it's nice to get to know him more intimately as a character. And I hope the purpose of these novellas are maybe that because they're kind of like secondary characters in Memories of Ice. So maybe hopefully we get more of them. I hope that's not the only time we see Boshalane and Corbo Broach throughout the main 10 or even the novels. But we don't know until we get there, I guess. That is true. That is very, very true. But yeah, I guess what you got for me. Well, just to kind of piggy off, uh, piggyback up your comment about him like his bravado and stuff. I do like how the sergeant isn't just like a, just a giant dick bag on like a power trip. Yeah. And you know, he can, he's like using some discretion here. He's like, all right, we can make this work. Like I'm going to get what I want one way or the other, but you can do this the easy way or the hard. Let's just yeah. kind of come to an agreement here, which, you know, is just something like nowadays, are you probably going to see something like that happen in like the real life? No, probably not. Probably and not. yeah, this is a book, but, it's probably based on some truth, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I thought, I just, yeah, I agree with you. I think that his solution was reasonable for both parties. Right. Yeah. I like that. It just wasn't, you know, I'm going to beat the shit out of you and get in here or, you know, like you're going to beat the shit out of me and I'm going to get turned away. There's, I, it's hard to say it was a compromise because I mean, I guess it was, but like, obviously Mancy's still not happy about it because he probably feels like, you know, he's still not really doing what he should in his yeah. mind, but it's the best option, I guess. Yeah. Or do you think it's just, you know, Gold mentions it earlier that he doesn't like messing with veterans. So do you think that it's possible that he may not think he can win that battle? Or do you think it's like a fear that made him come up with that solution? Or do you think it's just, he's just generally like genuinely trying to get the best out of a terrible maybe like a little bit of a messy scenario i think he could probably take him i i would imagine that his like dislike of having to mess with the veterans is probably that he doesn't want to have to kill him right you know yeah. gotcha makes sense my next thought uh i thought this you know bauschlein's talking about harnessing the energy of the slate towards border or how i reworded it and just since we're fresh off of Memories of Ice, I thought it was interesting and it made me think of like the Wandering Warns and shit or, or whatever that was. I don't remember exactly, but like it's immediately where my mind went to. Yeah, but it also could have something to do with what we find out at the end. I'm not sure if I'm remembering what you're talking about, so okay. Well, well I mean, when we get there, we can probably reference that if I remember. But sure. yeah, I agree though. Like it, it, when you when you called that out, I'm like, ah, yeah, I remember that scene in Memories of Ice, you know, when with uh, Draconis and Paran inside the sword again. Yeah, uh, I guess I kind of forgot about this comment that I had here, but I think I wonder if if Mancy knew he could afford to be a little bit bold in his dealing with uh, the sergeant because you know, like he he wasn't laughing, right? So like he knew he wasn't going to die. Maybe I didn't think of that. Uh, it's very possible. I mean, if I was, I guess, told that foretelling and I was in situations that I did not find funny, I knew I was safe, right? I mean, it seems reasonable to me. I mean, maybe that is the reason why he's got some bravado here, but that's kind of maybe. cool. That's a, that's a good call. Out. That's a good catch. Well, that was all I had here. This whole part with like the foreigners at the end was like really confusing to me especially with what comes later it makes sense to me now but like upon going through it it was it was a little weird for me but i i mean i get it now now that everything like 
now that I've finished Blood Follows, I understand this part a lot more. Well, I feel like when they're talking foreigners, they're talking about Bauschlein and Corbin, right? Yes. They cleverly get mistaken for someone else. The hunter dude? Yeah. Yeah. He is also a foreigner. Got you. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that I, did that did throw me off too. Because like you're thinking that like you know, Gold and Abler, you know, the scribe, right, are having this conversation about, well, wait a minute, there's no way that this guy could have left because he hasn't left since I got here, you know? But, like, Gold is relying on Obler to give a description of both of them. Gold has seen Boshelaine, so he's hoping for Obler, the scribe, to give some details about Corbel, right? And obler at this point in time says like no that's not possible like only both of them went in and i've only seen bosh lane come out so the other one still has to be in there and then gold is like how could you mistake a eunuch you know what i mean like kind of expecting for that to be picked out and obler it, i don't know if it was just like intimidation or or what you know kind of picks out the hunter because he's also a foreigner and just describes him instead, you know, but also it kind of makes it seem like when gold first encounters Obler, that there's maybe some history there that maybe he wasn't always a scribe and was maybe up to some no good in the neighborhood. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, those were, I guess all my really thoughts about uh, that interaction again, you know, like the story's kind of moving Gold has got some pieces to the puzzle here, and he's he's just he's investigating, right? Right. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm satisfied. I think he had some good thoughts there. So yeah, we can move on. All right. Bosseline told Nancy to have some wine, and then proceeded to fill up two goblets. Nancy apologized. Bosseline told him not to worry about it. And as the guard had said, it would have been unfortunate. But then asked why Reese had been so stubborn about it, as he seemed to be a wise man. Reese explained that he didn't want to fail his new masters, and he likes his new gig. Bosheline told him not to worry about that, as they had found him ideal. Reese couldn't help but wonder at what he meant by we. Bosheline continued to say that they see a long acquaintance between them, even though Reese's mind still holds its mysteries. Reese wondered at these mysteries his master was speaking of. For example, his wife. Reese explains that he loves his wife. And she's stuck by his side all these years. Boshelin says that it wasn't that, but in Reese's mind, Boshelin can hear his wife's voice, but there is no image of her. And that's what he finds so peculiar. They stared at each other for a moment until Boshelin downed his wine and said that he has work for Mancy tomorrow. He tells Mancy that he would like for him to book passage westward for as far as the ship will take them. Mancy asked if he would like his master to get a refund for the advance on the room. Boshelin said that would be unnecessary, but he wants to be out of mall in two days. He asked Mancy if that was possible. Mancy said that it was the turning of the season, and he could almost guarantee it. Boshelin said that this was good, but to be wary and take no risks. Mancy told him that this was no problem. Boshelin then asked about Mancy meeting Gold before. Mancy explained that he had spoken to Gold regarding his two previous employers' untimely deaths. His master nodded and stated that Gold was a sharp man. Mancy agreed and, agreed and told ma his master that Gold was famous and that the king commands that the sergeant perform investigations, especially those surrounding murders. On top of that, Gold has never failed. Boshlane puts it together that Gold is the one searching for his, this town's nightly murderer and that it was only a matter of time before they would be questioned. Being foreigners and all, Mancy said that he supposed his master was right. Boshlane continued and said that he liked his privacy and disliked official attention. And those were his reasons for wanting to leave. He tells Mancy to not alarm the sergeant. Reese assures his master that Gold won't hear a thing. Boshlane said that this was excellent and told Mancy to get his rest, as he'll need to leave rest or he will need to be well rested for his efforts tomorrow. Mancy said yes and thanked his master. He went to his bed and laid down. He thought to himself about alarming gold, as he was a necromancer and all. 
He was exhausted and expected to not sleep well, but sleep well he did. So kind of a really interesting kind of conversation between Bosch Lane and, and uh, Nancy. And, you know, I guess you don't really get like a ton of sense of that in Memories of Ice, but, you know, Bosch Lane actually kind of seems like to be a pretty compassionate person. I can see that. And he's just, I feel like he's sly and sneaky smart. Yeah. It's definitely the brains of the operation between the two. Oh, for sure. Yeah. This part where Bosch Lane is saying like, hey, I'm kind of curious about or he kind of like alludes to the mystery that Nancy's mind still holds and kind of gives an example about the fact that he can hear his wife's voice in Nancy's head, but there is no image of her and he finds that peculiar. And I wonder if like Erickson is just kind of calling out how people who are maybe in these types of relationships feel and questioning whether reese actually like how reese actually feels about her and i think steven is calling out the lack of romance a husband or wife may have for the other like it's a love out of obligation rather than infatuation you know what i mean so like i'm sure that like bosh lane is hearing subly berate and bitch at fancy and therefore Nancy seems to be kind of like a victim in this relationship and like doesn't really hold her in high regard. So therefore there's no image. I was curious. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's odd that he like, well, I mean, the whole thing is kind of odd that he's like, Oh, I can hear her, but I can't see what, you know, she looks like in your head. But yeah. I didn't really know what kind of what that derived from or anything like that. Yeah. So I like, your th I like your thought. Yeah. I think it's just calling out, bad relationships and how one feels about the other in kind of like a very subversive way. Gotcha. And then um, another thing at the end here that I thought was really funny is just, you know, <laughs> Bosch Lane is like, Hey, make sure that like, we don't alarm the Sergeant and you know, Reese as he's laying down is just like, I don't really know how else to alarm him because like you're a necromancer. I'm not. <laughs> You know, he was just like, really, I just chuckled at his sarcastic thoughts. So like, what could I do? Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, what could I do comparatively to you, a necromancer? Yeah. I think the one thing that like confused me a lot about this is like, there's really no, like, how is it that everybody knows that they're necromancers or at least suspect that they're necromancers when there's really nothing alluding to anything outside of these nightly killings i think they're just like dressed in black all, all the time like do they just look like they're a vampire or something maybe they just have that look maybe yeah i, I don't know it's just it's, it's just one of those like weird like minor detail things where it's just like how does mancy actually know that they're necromancers well i mean i guess at the end of the book we know why he knows he kind of gets the confirmation but yeah but up until this point, like, there's really nothing to insinuate what Bosch Lane and Corbel do outside of, like, the slates and Corbel's never there. Yeah, they do some weird shit. But, yeah. All right. Well, I'm, I don't have anything else to say about that uh, really cool section there. All right. We'll go on to uh, number five here. Yeah. Gold stepped into squints. The soldiers he sent to follow the foreigner said he was at the back. They could get a better view of him from the bar. As they pushed their way down the bar, voices quieted, then picked back up after they had gone by. He wished he had another 30 guardsmen to arrest everyone in the bar, as it was the diviest dive bar in Lamentable Mole. The soldier pointed to the man at the back table. Gold had been looking at the wrong dude, so the soldier corrected him. The man was eating noisily, and he told the soldier to wait. Gold approached, and the man was in the middle of a story about his wife being taken advantage of by some underage ghosts. I totally forgot about this part. Um, maybe we should have had a warning about this beforehand. Uh, Gold told him it was enough, and the man said that's what he said, too. He told the guy to shut up, find another table, leaving him alone with a foreigner. The local man said he was leaving, and he didn't do anything illegal, at least so far as Gold could prove. Gold said if he didn't leave right now, he didn't care if he could prove it or not, he would put him in the stocks for a few weeks. 
Gold turned to the foreigner and said he had some questions, namely, where was he from and why was he interested in the murder scene? The man said he was just taking in the sights. Gold said Mole, mole wasn't much to look at, uh, but there was more to it than shady alleys with corpses in them. Gold said that unless killing is what you do. The man said if it was what he does, he doesn't do it that way. Gold kept going, asking if that is what he does, what is he doing here? The man said he was only passing through. Gold asked if he was leaving tomorrow. The man said maybe. Gold asked where he was staying, and the man told him the soldier that he, or Gold, had telling him should know uh, know the answer to that question. Gold said he gives him regular reports. If he doesn't show up on time, Gold will take it upon himself to find him. The man said that was fine, and he got up to leave. Gold told him he left a piece of bread on his plate, and the man said it was for the gods. Gold asked, what if the gods were not hungry? The man said, they were always hungry. So, your comment earlier here, I was very confused reading this because I was like, this doesn't sound like Corporal at all, but I was sure that it was. Um, but it's like this, you know, Van Helsing type dude, like trying to hunt him down. Right, yeah, it's it's the it's the hunter. The other foreigner. Right, yeah. You know, but I definitely did not make that connection. Like even even like summarizing it, I was still kind of confused. So yeah, it's just you know at the you know, Obler identified the foreigner leaving Saruman's and had a soldier fault trail him right, which lent squint squint's bar right is the first kind of clue that it's really not Corbral because he doesn't like crowds. Uh, good point. Good point. Did not think about that. But he was at the back table. It might not be too busy. And he's got like his back to the wall, looking out at everyone is kind of what I imagine. So maybe that would put him at ease or something. But yeah, good point. I don't really see Corbel having a, a conversation about, or even the patience to overhear a conversation about underage ghosts. Uh, yeah, dude, that was, I totally forgot about that part until I started reading it. I'm like, oh yeah, this guy's, yeah, I don't know there's really a tasteful way to put that, but. Yeah, having some apparitions. Sure, yeah. That was pretty messed up, but I was, I was kind of like, oh Jesus, I wasn't expecting to read that in this book, but. Yeah. Um, here we are. But yeah, you know, the, uh, Squint's bar, right? The reason why it reminds me of Coltane is because Squint is the one who had to shoot the arrow at him. Right. And I was just really like your comment, like, oh, no, Coltane. I'm like, well, do you think Squint went off and started a bar? Like, uh, uh, No, I think it's just an Easter egg. How so? Because it's the name of the guy who shot Coltane. So, like, every time I see the word Squint, I'm going to think of that scene. Oh. Yeah. But, I mean, it's possible. Maybe Squint. I mean, he did disappear. He did disappear at the end of that. Remember how they couldn't find him? Yeah. So maybe he ran off to Lamentable Mall and started a bar. Maybe. Or maybe it's the kid from Sandlot. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> so, yeah, I had a comment in here, you know, like, I was confused. Like, I thought the dude was Corporal, the foreigner, and then that's kind of, you know, like, he came to my rescue, Justin, and uh, explained things. <laughs> so. Yeah. We've kind of talked about that, so we probably just skip that comment. For sure. But dude, like this line at the end where the man's like, the gods are always hungry. I just fucking like that. I thought that was a cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, from the three books that we've read of the main ten, I can absolutely see that. Like, that makes total sense to me. Hood is always hungry. Yes. Hood will feast. Well, that was all I had here. If you want to move on to your section. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kriege explained that Mancy looked horrible. As Ree sat down at the table, they converse about his wife giving him trouble in bed and converse about his kids getting the mange. Mancy tells him enough of this and tells him that he needs a boat. Craigie and Dooley edged closer to Mancy and said that this wouldn't be too hard. The pair lists off three separate ships, but each of them has its own unique flaw. Dooley raised his finger and told Mancy that there was a ship named the Sun Curl. Craigie, upon hearing the ship's name, goes into a coughing fit as if he swallowed his wine wrong. Mancy told Dooley that he hadn't heard of that one. Dooley explained that it came in from Stratum, Stratum and he and Craigie performed some refitting here and there, offloaded some items, and then sold them iron nails. 
Kriegi finally regained his breath and advocated for what Dooley was saying about the sun curl. Emancipor had finished his ale and rose from the table. He felt exhausted, like his thoughts were behind a fog. He thanks them and tells them that he'll head straight for the docks. Kriegi told him not to worry about it and then asked if Subly had any luck at the alchemist. Nancy thought to himself that he couldn't recall telling Kriegi that. Then again, Kriegi always dotes on their youngest kid, so maybe it was just that he was concer a concerned guy. He finally replied that Subly did well enough and thanked them both. Both Kriegi and Dooley said it was no problem and told them and told Nancy they'd see him later. Um, so some really interesting things, and it was kind of like a shorter, shorter section. This part, the sun curl. I think there's something about the ship. Also, I think that Dully and Kriegi kind of just put up with Mancy, or because they were the ones that told him about the job posting. Maybe they're also after Boschland and Corbel too, or maybe something along those lines, or maybe even using Mancy as bait to catch them. I don't know. I just don't trust them. And I think there's maybe a potential that they show up in a later novella. Maybe? It just kind of seems like uh, they want Mancy gone so they can go tag team his wife. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, me just thinking about, like, other situations, you know, if they were to catch this killer, maybe for whatever reason, they were the first to figure it out, you know, and they're just being elusive about it. Maybe. But also, like, again, they sold the crew of the Sun Curl the iron nails and in the last section we kind of get something about the nails on the boat they're like aspected or something yeah exactly and uh i think that if i had to predict right now what lee's of a laughter's end is going to be about is that um what we discuss in the end will get let loose well that makes sense because nate did tell us that he said it would be like if the thing was more funny or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I can, That's I can what buy I'm into guess. that. Huh? I can buy into that. Okay. All right. But then also like the, this whole, like, uh, Kriege goes into this coughing fit, the nails, and then this comment about how Mancy felt exhausted. Like his thoughts were behind a fog. You know, so like, I don't know if these guys are like a sorcerer of some kind or, you know, what's going on because yeah, I'm going to probably go with what you suggested. They're just trying to drive him out, even though it sounds like, or seems like they're helping him with the boat, with the job posting, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're, they seem like they're helping him out, but it's probably for their own benefit. Right. Right. Yeah. So maybe it would be cool if like this was revisited in some way. Like I'd like to just not leave it the way that it is, but I guess there's not much I can do about it. If it doesn't happen, <laughs> you get to write your own fanfic. Yeah, that is true. Um, and then lastly, uh, and you know, it kind of confirms our suspicions about subly being, maybe being unfaithful um, as even Reese suspects because Kriegi always dotes on his youngest kid. So it's very possible that Kriegi is maybe the father of the youngest child. I don't remember picking that up or reading that in the chat. I mean, I remember like the hints about her cheating and stuff, but I guess I don't remember the specifics on it. Yeah, very, very true. Well, I don't know if I have anything else to say about that particular section. It was, it was shorter, but it was like probably the one section that is so full of mystery and it was definitely making me wonder about many things. Sure. Gold made his way down Doll Street, from which hundreds of creepy Chucky dolls hung. Some of these were demon-possessed, and this was not one of his favorite places to be. The place he needed to get to was at the very back of the alley. This place also had creepy dolls hanging, and he had no idea who actually bought these fucking things. A deep but melodic voice called out to him, asking if he would like to buy a doll for his children. Gold only asked where the old woman was. The voice didn't know who he meant, and Gold clarified, asking for the woman who owns the shop. He wanted Mercy Blackpug. The woman laughed, saying that was her, and he must be thinking of his of her, of her sister, Mince, who brings her things to market. Gold called that old woman a hag and asked if she thought he was a fool. 
Mercy lit a hookah and said they have different lifestyles. She implores all manner of perversion and indulgence where her sister Mince does not. Gold only wanted to know where Mince was. Mercy said probably down by the docks, bugging soldiers and trying to get them to reform to her own lifestyle. Gold had a thought asking if this was the woman who petitioned the king every week. Mercy said that was her. She would see Lamentable Mole at Pure City and that she visits the murder sites to look for converts. Gold asked how then her sister tolerated her enough to sell her products. Mercy laughed, saying Lamentable Mole breeds criminals faster than rats, faster than the king can, can hang them. Gold looked at the doll and asked if it was pigskin or not. Mercy said it was the skin of a criminal. Mince finds the irony hilarious. Most of her com customers are relatives of the dead. These were small tokens of their memory. The human mind is unimaginable. Gold said he may be back. Mercy said to keep an eye out for his sister. As Gold left, Mince's head popped out between two dolls and said, She will be the death of you. She is a pit, a whirlpool of licentiousness, a knower of moles most secret and vice-ridden lairs. You would not believe the extent of her business interests. Gold's ears perked up at the word lair and wanted to know who visited these places. Mint said her sister knows all, except how to take care of herself and that ill health stocks her. He would see soon, unless she changed her ways. He looked back down the alley and figured there was no time like the present. He only needed to question Mercy. It might take hours, but that couldn't be helped. Mintz hissed at him and not to succumb to her. Gold marched back down Doll Street. Very nice. I don't know if I really have that many thoughts outside of, do you think that these sisters are polio and solio? Uh, that makes sense. I did not have that thought. As I was reading this, I kind of was thinking um, along the lines that it's like you got the devil on one shoulder and your angel on the other is almost what it seems like. But you, you're, you're, I think maybe you're on something. Maybe you're right. Yeah, maybe it's like the gods, you know, incarnate type of thing or in human form or whatever you want to you want to call it. But I mean, kind of like uh, Aruli being cruel, like that type of thing. Like, yeah, I can yeah. see that. I think that makes sense. I know that in Memories of Ice, uh, Polio, right, the god the goddess of pestilence, right? She was mentioned at being on the crippled god's side. Maybe there will be a reference to this in some way, shape, or form. Like, Maybe. You know? So I, I did not think of that, Justin. That's another really good thought, and I like it, and I hope it's right. Yeah, I hope so. I'm not putting a pie on it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't think we need any pies for this book. No. I mean, you're you're more or less agreeing with the, the concept and theory, so I'll take Absolutely. that. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. These dolls are fucking creepy. You got uh, Chucky dolls pieced together, like, literally from criminal skin. So those movies scare the shit out of me. I'm not watching them. Uh, I don't want to see one of these dolls. So, Did you watch Megan? I didn't see that. Okay. Hmm. I think okay. the last, like, actual horror movie I saw was, well, I saw Smile and then I saw The Black Phone. Those are pretty good. All right. Fair enough. Well, I guess at this point we should probably move on then, huh? Yeah, I don't have anything else here for that section, so I'm good. All right. Knoll Barrel was the largest lamentable mall, and the only grassy one. It had been picked clean, but still looters and antiquarians came. On top of the barrel, Gold found Mole's two distinguished rat hunters, Rickless, Punth, and Blather Roll. Gold, on occasion, would make use of their vast knowledge of the city's underworld, as Gold approached, he heard them talking about the purity of blood. He asked Plunth what made his blood so pure. Plunth gave a response, and Blather Row is seen opening a jar of pickled mice with his dagger. Gold takes in the pair, and smaller discussions are had, until Blather Row asks Gold to join them. Berkless observes that Gold is not here for eating or chatting, but because of the murderers or murders each night. He is here on official duty. Blather and Berkless, or yeah, Berkless have a small scrape about civility before Gold tells them to shut it. Gold then asked if White Mane really did exist. They both said that he did, in fact, exist. Gold then asked if he was soul taken. They both replied that he was, and when he veered, he's the most intimidating of rats. 
Bill takes all that they have to say and then asks why White Mane is cowering from the murderer. Berkless replies that White Mane is burrowed deep and quivering. Gold asks if it was likely that White Mane has met the murderer. The two rat catchers say that it's possible, but it was more likely because of White Mane's guards or runners. Berkless asked if there was anything else they could do for the sergeant. Gold replied that he would like to know more about the princess and Lord Zimholm. Berkless raised his eyes and said that this was not a conversation for dinner. Gold told them that he could wait. Uh, I did not like that they called like the baby rats pinkies or whatever. And, like, ate yeah. those. those fucking gross. <laughs> well, I mean, as uh, someone who has uh, a snake in the house and has to purchase mice for it to eat, uh, pinkies is just basically newborn mice that have been frozen. Oh shit! I did not know that was like a real thing. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. Pinkies. I, I, they probably are pink-ish. They haven't like, quite they have gotten fur? their fur, and it's pretty much just their skin is pink. Oh. So the the snake eats them when they're dead, but don't want them alive. Correct. The snake we have. I'm sure that there are some snakes who prefer, like mainly constrictors. Oh. But. I know that when we had first got the snake uh, as a Christmas gift for my daughter, the snake didn't really want, it, it had a hard time eating. So one of the things that we had to do until it, it kind of caught on is you would have to take a lighter and warm it up, you know, warm up oh the pinky. God. Yeah, dude. <laughs> so that like, you know, it's, it senses on the end of its nose could like detect the heat and would strike at it. Um, so that was, that was cool. Yeah. And no fucking idea. That was a thing. All right. Yeah. Well, I learned something tonight and mice, the next size up, they're called fuzzies because they have grown their hair at that point, but are not quite like adult. Uh, so it was weird, you know, like, obviously I'm giving you these descriptions and you can imagine what's happening when I'm like reading the section. I'm like, gross. They're pickling the mice in vinegar. <laughs> And eating them, like, ugh. It's just, it was gross. Hit home a little bit more for you than me, then. It, it, yeah, yeah, it was definitely interesting, but... Oh, I'm, I'm glad you can relate to it to some extent. I, I'm good. But. So, the only other thing that I had, like, I didn't really have a lot. I mean, the section with the dolls and the section with, like, these two rat hunters kind of feel out of place for me a little bit, but... I mean, I guess, I guess, I mean, I understand for what they are, but White Mane, when I first read this, I'm like, this is really similar to Gray Mane, but not any type of correlation between the two. Or maybe there is, and I'm just not catching it, but... We just don't know. Yeah. But, I mean, it, it, uh, I totally understand why my White Mane is, is hiding, right? Because, you know, he's seeing his runners or guards or whoever he's got as a, as his employee the rats getting their minds wiped right because we saw that in kind of like the very beginning of of the the novella right yeah but outside of that those those were really the only things that i had picked out so i'm i'm good to move on if you are man sure Dead Sekaran's tower creaked in the breeze. Gold wrapped up in his cloak thought it was more because he was tired than cold. Gold, oh, Gold heard Ofen make his way to the platform and bitched that meeting on the street corner would have been more his style. Gold said he may have the man. Ofen asked how certain he was and when he would make the arrest. Gold said he hadn't worked out the details yet, but his gut was telling him it was this man, even though it he felt as if he was missing something. Ofen asked how he could be of service. Gold said he was thinking of the hounds he had sent on the trail leading from Humi's murder, a man or two, one a warrior or a veteran, and the other unknown. That in a woman's sense, or two, or maybe none. This didn't make sense to Ofen, because if there was a woman sent, how could there be none? Gold said that was a good question. Could he answer it? There was a woman who fled the scene that night, but she wasn't the killer. Ofen still couldn't make sense of this. Gold explained that it was a eunuch. Ofen said that made sense. Gold had found the killer. Gold said he knew him, but had not found him, though he thought someone else had. Ofen asked what he meant. Gold said she was on the move and told Ofen to go home. The night's work began in earnest. 
I thought it was really clever how he kind of like figures out what's going on. And, and my guess is like behind the scenes, he kind of discovers something with his conversation with the two rat catchers that we just are not privy to. Sure. Is my guess, maybe. I will go along with it. Yeah. Uh, and, and like I said, I feel like a lot of what happens in the section kind of gets explained in the beginning of mine. Uh, as to like what he has discovered. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really have any thoughts here. Just kind of the only thing, like I guess I'm a little confused. I'm wondering if one of these foreigners, you know, is it that other hunter? I don't know. Yeah, which part? Sorry. Well, just you know that there's a man or two, a warrior, or a veteran. The other unknown. Um, that there's a woman sent or two, or maybe none. Um, you know, are they tracking this hunter that's also tracking Corbel and Bauschlein too? Do you think? Um, I think this is just kind of uh, the Sergeant Gold being evasive about what he knows, and he's kind of like riddling Ophan Stuhl about it. He's just kind of being clever. And that whole section with the dogs, you know, they did run into like some conflicting sense. I feel like a lot of this just what he comes to to the revelations is explained in the beginning of my section, so... Well, we can just get right into it here. If you're ready, I'm good. I'm ready too. Gold had done his due diligence. He had enough details to put things together. Holm had an appetite for blood and pain. This was the reason Princess Sharn and Holm were drawn together. This was also the reason for Holm's father and the king what made the union so frightening. The princess's maid had already been sent off on the killer's trail. To Sharn, Homi was a toy in comparison to what Corbel could do, and she wanted more. The maid had done her job well, as Gold's man had reported her back at dawn, and now she and the princess were on their way to meet the murderer. Gold exited the tower and quickly made his way down the streets. Gold didn't want to be too late, even though he thought it would teach the king a lesson, especially for impeding his investigation. The satisfaction of that wasn't worth the life of a young woman, though. He worked out their route thanks to his system of lights. He arrived at an alley at the mouth of Fishmonger's Round ahead of him, and it was completely empty. He thought he arrived with minutes to spare. The round was empty, a crow sat on the top of a pole, asleep, and a dog loped across the cobblestones. He slowly unsheathed his longsword and hoped his squad had been able to follow the trail. A single knot of uncertainty tugged at the sergeant's belly. The eunuch had left Saruman's undetected, and what troubled Gold was that there were sorceries that could, have, that could achieve that. A cloaked woman entered the round, and Gold thought to himself that this was the handmaiden. She moved towards the pole, and he thought that this made no sense. He thought to say something, to speak out, but chose not to. A second figure, the princess, following the handmaiden. They approached the pole, and the crow on top stirred itself. Gold finally understood, and he opened his mouth to bellow a warning when he was hit from behind on the head. The man apologized to Gold and explained that there was only one of them, and in order for the other to appear, he needed to draw blood. Gold realized that it was the foreigner from Squints. The foreigner said that the sergeant could have, have, could have what's left of them to appease the mob. Gold tried to get up but couldn't. He watched as the scene unfolded. The crow veered into a man. When he landed, he raised his hand, giggled, and the handmaiden was killed. Princess Sharn groaned with ecstasy at the sight. Corporal slowly approached the princess. Beside Gold, the hunter raised his bow and aimed. Gold whispered to the man to shoot. The sergeant watched as suddenly the man was straining, as if being held by something invisible. A voice spoke from behind them, calling Shtek Mer Mernard. Mern Mernd. Boshelaine explains that Shtek is being held by a demon. Boshelaine stepped around the two and said that this manacle pursuit was a waste of time, and Mernd should, be, should retire. For the last time, Boshelaine has decided to spare his life as he's only a minor irritation. Boshelaine tells Corbrel to leave the princess alone, as a handmaiden shall suffice for tonight. Corbrel said that Princess Sharn has been touched twice, and she belonged to him last night. 
He asked Bosch Lane if he could, why he would deprive him of that. Bosch Lane said that Corporal had enough, and besides, he was dispatched their manservant to the dock for a boat, and their departure is imminent. Corporal tells Bosch Lane that all who have trailed him have assembled, so let's just kill them all, and they'll be at ease again, able to run around Lamentable Mall without resistance. Bosch Lane said it's not that easy, as Steck will not die by their hands and will actually live for some time. As for the sergeant, well... The mortal sword of the sisters, Talgard Vice, swore a blood vow, focused by the high priestesses of the sisters. Like Shtek, the goddess-charged fool that is Talgard Vice will not stop. Even now, Vice defies his wards. He turned as Talgard Vice broke through a ward. With a sigh, Boshling said that Talgard's power was formidable, but he forgot to bless the horse. Bosch Lane raised his hand, and a, bar and, a and a borrow Vice had been riding by snagged the horse and Vice and swallowed them in. Bosch Lane swung by to his friend and stated that they've overstayed their welcome, and they really must be going. It was time. At that moment, White Mane darted from the shattered barrow, and Bosch Lane gestured with his hands again. A demon rose and reached down and snatched the rat up and shoved it in its mouth. Boshelaine told the demon to spit that rat out. The demon spat out the rat and it rolled onto the cobblestones, motionless. Boshelaine asked Corbel to check if the soul taken was okay. Corbel sniffed in the rat's direction and told his friend that the soul taken would live. Boshelaine told the demon to gather up White Mane and to get back in his trunk. Boshelaine was interrupted as Blather Rowe and Berkless Punth showed up and told the necromancers to hold a second. Boshelaine asked who these two might be. Corbel is heard saying to kill them, as they make him nervous. Gold thought to himself that they're just rat hunters. What's with all the anxiety? Berkless was eyeing the demon and commanded it to be gone. The demon wavered and then disappeared. White Mane suddenly lifted his head and bolted for the shadows. Boshlane said that he didn't appreciate his servants being dismissed by anyone but himself. Berkless shrugged at this and said that Mole may be a modest city, but that's just the appearance. And what the necromancers have done have upset things. Things that don't like to be upset. They told the pair that enough was enough and banished them from Lamentable Mall. Boshlane agreed and said that they were just leaving. Gold was finally able to get himself up and he cursed at Boshlane. The necromancer turned around and told Gold that his troops were not slain, and that they just wandered around confused. Berkless confirms to Gold that this was true. Boshlin put a hand on Corbel's shoulder and said that they should join their manservant at the docks. Gold watched the two men stride off. Princess Sharn seemed to shake herself awake, and it dawned on her that Corbel had meant to kill her. Gold told Sharn that she was an idiot as what could she have possibly used to appease a eunuch? The rat catchers tipped their hats at gold and left. The sergeant's eyes finally saw the handmaiden, her body in a pool of blood. He saw a stray jog trot out in the body's direction. He thought to himself that this was madness. In the shadows, a cackle was heard, and a voice followed, telling gold that following a life of vice gets yet nothing. Whew, for sure a long one. That was a little longer, yeah. Yeah. So uh, kind of going back to like your previous section and, and what Gold had figured out is that uh, Princess Sharn and Lord Sumholm were like masochists a little bit, like into doing harm. What had happened the night before, from what I understand, even though it's not really like explicitly said, is that when Corbel killed Lord Sumholm, Sharn was so like infatuated by that that she like ordered her handmaiden to follow him thus the conflicting smells to the hounds if that makes if that kind of puts the picture together i think so yeah i just the only comment i had here about that is that they were nasty little fucks so <laughs> way to way to parse it down there justin yeah yeah <laughs> but i mean that's also why Lord Sub's father and the king were trying to, you know, quell the rumors is because they didn't want their reputation to be salted by this kind of revelation here. 
So that's why there was some cover up there. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, when your your uh, kids into some weird stuff. I mean, I guess it's not weird to her, but probably yeah. to the majority of people, right? Yeah. So I think this is what Gold was trying to tell Ofen in a very like riddly type of way. It it, it was just such an action packed, and it just kind of seemed like everybody just kept showing up. You know, like the hunter, the foreigner that uh, Gold had confronted in Squints. You know, he's been tracking Corbel Brooch and Boshelaine, right? So, like, obviously there's some beef there. Has been following them. You get the Mortal Sword, briefly. Yep. yep, you get the Rat Catchers. But, you know, it's funny. I really get the sense that these Rat Catchers are more powerful than we think they are. I'm not really sure if that will be explained or what's going on, but, like, they kind of almost give me, like, a Baruch-type vibe. We're like on the outside, they're just like this, you know, they do this very dirty job, but like they really know all of the undertakings that happen that the city doesn't want you to know about, you know? Sure. So the other thing that I had here was just uh the mince, right? The sister mince has obviously trained a dog to go retrieve bodies and bring them back to her. And this is why Gold was like this is madness. And then she, you know, obviously tells him that following a life of vice gets you nothing. So I don't remember picking up on that at all. Yeah. Or, Usually when things don't make sense, they tie into something that is, I, yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but like, I'm like him saying that this dog trotting out is into the body's direction was madness. And then mints right in the next sentence, like, Aha, you know, and we know that she like makes she makes uh dolls out of, of corpses skin. Mm. So like it makes sense she would have something to fetch it. I don't know. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah I, you need to acquire your supplies somehow. So yeah, I mean I have questions, but I, I feel like for the most part I understand what happened. I'm satisfied with this conclusion, so to speak. All right. Well, we're ready to finish this off here. Let's do it to it. All right, Lars. Mancy woke groggily looking at the four travel trunks, and it came back to him that he was on the Sun Pearl. It had been a rough night. He looked back at the trunks and remembered how damn heavy they were. He remembered hearing a sound odd enough to wake him up. Something was moving around in Corval Broach's trunk. Mancy unlocked the latch and opened it, horrified by what he saw inside. He gagged and slammed the lid closed while he tried to reattach the restraining straps. Mancy needed to get out of there. He made his way topside and found Bausch Lane, seemingly unaffected by the ship's pitching and rolling in the waves. Bausch Lane said he thought he wouldn't have been affected by the sea such as he was. Mancy said it would take a day, but he would be fine. Bausch Lane asked if he had looked at his work, meaning the slate. Mancy said yes. Bausch Lane said the slab preserves and, if needed, provides sustenance. It always works out that he learned something new, and they are all the better for it. Bausch Lane asked if Mancy was okay. Mancy didn't answer, just staring out into the waves, but all he could think about were the organs he saw sewn together, holding onto the souls in a prison from which they couldn't escape. Moshlane said the sea air always makes him feel rejuvenated, and he was excited to keep exploring the world. And now he would heal Mancy from his illness. He knew what caused it. It was between his ears. Mancy thought of Subly as Moshlane remarked on the sunlight and how he didn't see enough of it then pointed out to Corbel in his crow form, flying in the sky. Boschlane said he also sent something wrong with the ship, and the captain and his mum on their destination, and there is something wrong with the nails holding the ship together. Mancy thought to himself that he did what Boschlane wanted. He got them passage as far west as he could, and now he was trapped. Boschlane asked how long the journey would be. Mancy thought forever to himself, but when he spoke, he said months. Boschlane said it might be an unpleasant trip then, as the nails seemed to affect the slat slab. The nails were aspected in some fashion, and Corbel's child might escape. Mancy laughed hard and covered his mouth, but he had scattered the seagulls, whose squawking was quickly silenced. Bauchlane said he didn't know if seagulls burned so easily, and that he hoped Mancy would compose himself, uh, that Mancy would compose himself quickly, as Corbel was looking mighty agitated. Uh oh. So, a nice. Easy, fair conclusion, right? I mean, makes sense, but it also leaves you with like a little bit of wonder too. Yeah. 
So obviously this is like the meat puppet that we saw in Memories of Ice that's in the trunk, I would assume. Maybe not this particular meat puppet, but yeah. But it's the same thing anyway, yeah, yeah I suppose. Yeah. So the slab, it will preserve the organs in the trunk and like they could eat it if they need to. Is that kind of what it's getting at? Is that what you took from it? No, I I, I agree with you on the... Uh, like it'll preserve the organs kind of like some like sorceress formaldehyde i guess you could say but i also thought that it gave it its sustenance so like it gave the organs nutrients to be able to survive type thing uh okay maybe it's both i don't know maybe i mean corporal doesn't eat apparently so it's funny that he's the fat one yes he's he's got enough sustenance to last a while i guess Hmm, maybe he should leave the tennis gallery. The tennis gallery diet? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Or uh, I guess that would be the talk diet. Partake. So, <laughs> Bauschlein wants to heal Mansi from this, you know, I guess essentially what I would call seasickness or what it, well, it's kind of what it appears to be seasickness, but I, you know, he's just kind of disgusted by what he sees in the, in the trunk, right? Yeah. But to me, it seems like, uh, Bauschlein probably wants to wipe his memory because, What's between your ears? Your brain. Yep. Uh, yep. So he wants to do it like the rats. And so he, I suppose he can't tattle their secrets to somebody else. I don't know. Probably. Maybe. And that's maybe the reason why he's laughing like a fucking idiot at the end here. It's just like, what What have I gotten myself into? Like, holy shit. My mind's going to get wiped. You know? I took it as he was like laughing like, you know, if this fucking thing gets out, it's going to be a nasty trip, and he's probably just like, what the fuck did I get myself into? Yeah, exactly. For sure. That's all I've got. That's it? That's it? That's it, wow. man. That's it. We finished We finished a book in, what, cumulatively, like... Two weeks? Less than four hours of podcasting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I would imagine this episode will probably be, like, an hour and 20 minutes. The first one was about an hour and a half, so... Nice. Probably what our normal episode should be. We are not normal. And I th- no. I think no. uh I think our first House of Shades episode will be longer. Yeah, probably. I mean I haven't finished it, but yeah, there's definitely lots of cool stuff to talk about. Oh and dude, you haven't finished it yet? No, I haven't finished it yet. I think I've got like I think I'm thirty pages in. So I think I got like twenty left. Twenty or thirty left. Gotcha. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's it's already pulled me in. I'm like Let's go. Yeah. But this uh, this novella was a fun little palate cleanser. Um, nice to read something short and knock it out in two episodes. So, yeah. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoy it, listening to it. Uh, it definitely was, I don't know, it was weird, but I think that's kind of the point, right? Yeah. yeah. Palate cleanser is probably a nice way to put it. You know, it's not like heavily staked. You know, it was kind of like a... A nice little like murder mystery type of novella just taking place in the Malazan universe. So yeah, I'm excited to get to know them more. I'm sure that like obviously there's some good character development if there's seven novellas of these these two characters. So but oh oh yeah, that was uh we get we get the first instance of Mancy cracking his tooth in the section. Remember when he like? Did, did I not summarize it? You did not. Uh, okay, I didn't catch it then. Yeah, it uh, it happens kind of near the end. Uh, yeah, Emancipor clamped his mouth shut. He felt a tooth crack. Oh really? Oh, I totally missed that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, nice catch. I know that. Uh, I only remember that because I had such a hard time understanding what the hell <laughs> was happening <laughs> in that episode with Jim. So well. I guess, uh, well, that's probably it for this one, huh? Yeah. So I guess uh, thanks, y'all, for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.